Hi, and uh, welcome to Cornell Tech. This has been a dream of mine uh, basically for three and a half years. I'm Diane Levitt, and I am the Senior Director of K-12 Education here at Cornell Tech. Um, you'll hear more about what we do here uh, toward the end of the program, but I just wanted to say how excited I am that you're all here. Campus has been open for about a month. Uh, so for instance, we didn't really know how to raise the blinds, and then <laughs> they just opened by themselves. <laughs> because. No, it wasn't the clapping. We tried the clapping. It's because tech, OK? Uh, so I'm really, really so thrilled that you're here. Uh, this is our first big tent event, and we're going to have uh, many this year. And the reason we're all here is uh, the person I'm going to introduce you to. Um, so I'm going to hand the mic off to Gordon Campbell who is the chairman of the CS department at the Dalton School, and my friend, and my colleague, and the guy who made this happen. There you go. Uh, well, this is one of my first Phil Donahue moments here. I don't talk to, well, mostly kids, and so uh, large, large group. Uh, so Diane, uh, thanks for doing this. This is a lot of heavy lifting to get this off the ground in such an amazing, cool space. So thank you, like, a ton. Um, so we came into the, this idea of putting CSTA in New York sort of by chance and very, very recently. Um, uh, in April, I think it was, and maybe many of you were there out in Seattle for the uh, SIGSI uh, conference and um, I saw one of the CSTA folks sitting at a table and all alone with not many visitors and I went over to him and I said how was business and uh, I said I'm from New York and can you tell me who the contact person is in New York City because I'd like to uh, be involved in CSTA and uh, he said there currently wasn't a chapter and uh, I ran into um, Michael and uh, Diane at the bar <laughs> As it turns out. That's true. And um, I said, there's no CSTA for New York City. How can that be? New York City's you know, so monstrous. And uh, right there and then, maybe with a little lubrication, we decided to put something together. So um, uh, when we met a couple of times this summer, it was sort of like, let's lick the stamp, put in the envelope, and get this thing going, and we'll worry about everything else later. So that time has now arrived. Um, the first time I had to do anything to do with an organization for uh, computing was 1982. I'm not one, one to uh, join. I'm more of a laborer or worker than s sitting at the top of this. So I, I don't come into this with any sort of pride of authorship. It's sort of like, let's just get this thing going. Um, my first one was DPMA. So for those of you who go back a few years, the Data Processing uh, Management Association. Um, that was 30 plus years ago. Uh, so I want to talk about a couple of things, and I made a couple of notes cause, just in case I forget it. But my history is sort of my, I think might work for most of you. Is um, coming into computer science in 2004 at the high school level, I taught at a couple of our universities here, and I brought the curriculum from, that I was using at the university level and just sort of tried to ratchet it and time it to. Um, 9 through 12, and there's just nobody to talk to. And uh, once in a while, I'd run into my colleague, Mike Zemanski, over there. And I heard he's very famous in comp sci land. And I said, Mike, I really need some help here. And he's like, I got too much going on. <laughs> um, but uh, he was helpful. Um, but growing the network was very difficult. Um, when I looked around to find out what other schools were doing computer science inside of the, um, New York City, uh, it was just not really not there. And so I felt I was in a bubble for a long time. So the networking portion, um, you know, the, the CSTA and CSNYC and um, CS for All now is just, I think it's just critical mass. We're at a really cool spot. I don't, uh, don't feel alone anymore. Um, and this sort of this hyper growth, I would say, is like a startup situation. You know, you start off with, you know, two folks and three folks, and before you know it, you've got a monster on your hands. And so I think that uh, having this collective together to sort of figure out what all the different constituencies are and what all the different needs are, I think um, will sort of help each other. So 
I can't predict the immediate future, but I can say that I think we should sort of stick together and help each other out. And even if it comes to a, one of these meetings where um, the agenda might be something you're interested in or not interested in, I think your networking value is ridiculously helpful. I go to all the events not knowing what I'm going for besides water and cheese, but uh, <laughs> um, I think the networking value is just tremendous. And so I'm hoping that Tom, you guys will come again. I don't know where our next event will be yet, but um, this one was a great start. Um, so one thing I wanted to put into your head is, for those of you that have been in organizations before for computer science and uh, uh, maybe CSTA members from prior years or other sort of affiliate groups, I think this is a, sort of a new start, like a fresh start. And there's, there's, a, there's a, a lot to do, but there's no uh, ownership per se. Like uh, I think coming to putting yourself and say, I'm interested, I'll help in this regard or uh, maybe constituent groups or birds of a feather that we, like uh, ACM60 uh, puts together, I think that may be a good place to start. So what we're gonna try and do is identify those different constitu constituencies and send out a survey and say, okay, this is my group and this is what, or this is where I could help. And then uh, sometimes those birds of a feathers will meet in their own um, domain or maybe it's a borough type of thing or uh, something like that. So I think you, if you all fill out the CSTA link here that Diane put together, that'd be super helpful because we can send out and say, do you want to play? Um, and the, the last thing I would say is, um, and I speak for myself being like super busy, you know, uh, as a teacher, a high school teacher, there's lots, lots to do and you know, it's like to run a marathon every year. Um, <clears throat> I always carve out time for any of the events that have been put on by M Michael and others and inside of the city, knowing that um, I'm probably helping somebody else, a junior teacher that is just getting going, and uh, somebody that's stuck or needs an idea, or an, me getting thousands of ideas. So I th your presence is ridiculously uh, as valuable as whatever we're going to talk about that day. So um, I'll, I'll stop now. <clears throat> Thank you, Gordy. Uh, Gordy and I actually go way back. We, we uh, worked on a project together at Columbia University um, uh, 50 or 60 years ago. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we, uh, so also, I wanted to say thank you again to Diane Levitt, who is our gracious host here tonight in this beautiful new campus at Cornell Tech. Um, it was my first time here just a couple of weeks ago, and so I was excited that we were able to, to come here and share uh, what is hopefully going to become a premier destination for lots of smart people. Um, so consider yourself among the first smart people to take the tram or the F train over. Um, did anyone do a, a get here not via tram or F train? Was there an, another t driving? Yes. Swimming? Driving. Uh, great. So it's it's pretty, pretty great to be here. Um, there is a member of our faculty who uh, uh, kayaks here. Every day from Queens. Yeah. Just saying, in case anybody's looking for that opportunity. That is awesome. I live in New Jersey, and that's never occurred to me. Um, so uh, that's really great. Um, and I also not. I think there's the the symbolic factor of 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 having this here because Cornell Tech, while based in the Google Building for the past several years, was also uh, a place many of us gathered. Um, teachers, nonprofits, and others in this space who, who have been critical to helping us build a computer science movement here in the city. Uh, and Diane has been very much at the center of that, so thank you for that. Um, and um, let's see, so briefly, so my name is Michael Preston. I run an organization here in the city called CSNYC. We've actually been doing these meetups for close to four years now, um, which is hard to believe. It's a lot of pizza. Um, this all began uh, to, to build on Gordy's comment earlier. We, this actually started in fall of 2013. I think it was at a bar. Uh, it might have been coffee shop. Who was, was anyone at that first meetup in the room right now? We gathered and men spoke. Men spoke? Yes. <laughs> and then it was like, shall we do this again? Uh, but it wasn't a bar, it was like an actual thing. So I might have been at Yeah, that might have been number two. two. Um, this meetup has been run over the years by uh, members of CSNYC, including Cindy Gao and Maur Baror, and um, it has 
grown uh, in membership. Um, the, the contents of that bar on day one, uh, we, we would vastly exceed that number now. We're at more than 2,000 members of this meetup. Um, that is also a lot of pizza. Um, and um, over the years, we've had a lot of great guest speakers, um, meetups focused on sharing and um, deep dives in pedagogy and different programs. And um, we were basically, we, we reached a point where um, the, in tandem with the, the New York City Department of Ed's Computer Science for All program, uh, and just this massive interest in the space, that there was this, a growing community that really needed to um, have access to each other and really determine uh, its course going forward. And so I was excited to, to, as we turn the page on a new school year, to, to really take a step back and think about what, what, what would be most useful to this group. So that is the theme for tonight and hopefully why you all came, not just to see uh, Cornell Tech's new campus. Um, that's a perfectly acceptable reason and um, square pizza. Um, Okay, no more pizza comments. Sorry, there's three. And, and, the little, view, and the view right behind There's a great view back here. This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so anyway, the, so this is, this is a, an exciting new chapter here. Um, CSNYC has uh, made some changes over the past year, too, where we're, we're increasingly involved in a national computer science for all movement that you may have heard of. Um, there were big announcements. Uh, this week that we are we are not um, directly connected to out of the White House and from Co.org and, and a lot of massive uh, tech companies and that's all exciting news for the community. But we're everyone in this room. I think what what I love most about this meetup is that the folks who are on the ground making this happen in classrooms, working in school districts or in local companies and nonprofits that are involved in this initiative. What's exciting is that this is the group that is actually making it happen. And so all of the energy that you see coming from government and from funders and industry and everybody else who is trying to kind of contribute in their own way, this is because of the work that's been happening for the last few years. And, and New York City being the largest and in some ways uh, ahead of the pack in terms of, of our, our thinking and our, our, our group effort here uh, make, make us uh, a special place. So um, I'll conclude by saying um, thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to circulating later and, and, and talking to folks. Um, did I miss anything? Was that, was that all I need to say? You talked about the national work. Yeah, the national work is happening. If you want to talk more about the national work, um, I'll, talk to you, I'll talk to you more about it. Um, we're having a summit in October that you may have heard about um, in St. Louis where people from all over the country are coming together with a, f a special focus on school districts. This is, the, this is like the new frontier. How do you talk to school districts so that they prioritize computer science education and plan for it in a way that's long-term sustainable and is based on, a, a, on values of rigor and inclusion at the same time? I don't know if any of you were able to call in last week when we did our national briefing call uh, and President Obama made a surprise visit. Um, he echoed the, the values of, of, that we espouse, which are, the, are making sure that we do this um, very well and for the long run. So it was, it was, that was a lot of fun as well. Um, all right, so without further ado, Ankit. Ankit's next. Ankit. Ankit. So it's my pleasure to introduce Ankit Patel uh, from the New York City Department of Education, um, who's going to speak to us about their brand new blueprint in beta. Um, and without further ado. Hi, everybody. I'm Ankit Patel. Uh, how many people here know what the Blueprint is already or have worked on the Blueprint or have contributed in some way to the Blueprint? Wow, OK. Hold on. I didn't expect that many people to know about the Blueprint. So let me back up and ask my question in, in steps here. All right, so first of all, people know about the New York City Department of Ed Blueprint for Computer Science Education. Whoa, that's cool. <laughs> Um, I should make sure that I iron out the bugs sooner rather than later. Um, okay, how many people worked on it? Yeah, yeah, Diane, you're included for sure. Great. Yeah, so I, there's already a, like, so there, there's definitely a lot more people that know about it than, than worked on it. I was sort of expecting coming up here that that was going to be a more, that number was going to be a little bit more similar, but that's really cool. What, basically what we tried to do with the blueprint, which I'm going to try to pull up as I continue to talk to you, is um, sort of define what computer science education looks like in New York City, but to not do it in the sort of, I think, typical government DOE, and this is me sort of 
uh, assuming that this is how government works, but sort of in a, in a black box. We wanted to do it with the community since there was already a lot of really interesting, robust things happening, stuff that, that had come out of uh, pilot programs at the Department of Ed, but also stuff that was just people were, people were teaching computer science, you all know, like you kind of kind of figure it out and you do it. Um, and so we started, was it, it was March of last year, started having convenings. Um, we started at one of our professional development sessions and asked teachers, okay, uh, how do you actually do this in your classroom? What are the challenges to learning uh, uh, computer science? Uh, what are the things that you do to, like, how do you actually like present this to your kids? What are the things that are realistically sort of accomplished within a class period? Um, be, and we just kept asking question after question after question for, I think we did 27 or 26, something like that, different sessions over the course of a year. So basically one every two weeks. Um, really earning our pay, and uh, through that came up with this, the blueprint, which basically what it tries to do is very simply describe what in New York City is the goal of CS for All. And so every place, like the, the national goals, and Arkansas has some state goals, and Chicago has some graduation requirements. In New York City, the goal is to have a meaningful unit of CS happen at K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, 9, 12. Now, that is, I think, purposefully vague. Our politicians are sometimes good at that, and, it, and it's good. It, like, it gave us some room to work and to define some things. Um, so the blueprint tries to define that. Uh, so just going to quickly like take you through some of the things that are on here. Um, so we have just sort of what is CS education to us in New York City. Largely, it's creative computing. Um, a lot of the background of the folks on our team, myself, uh, the sort of the guy that, w that headed up the software engineering program, Don Miller, who is enjoying himself in Florida right now, uh, working for code.org, and some other folks on our team came from a program out of New York University called the Interactive Telecommunications Program, which was started by um, a woman, Red Burns, back in the 70s, who had a porta pack camera, and she's like, okay, I'm gonna make a weird use of this. I'm gonna connect elderly people in different places with each other so they can video chat back in the 70s. And we sort of grew from there to a very like, interesting creative computing place where um, folks have probably heard of or maybe used processing or P5, grew out, you know, lots of use of those things there. Arduino, same thing. And so um, basically the ethos tried to be, I tried to articulate it here. Um, we also have a interesting take on it by Ben Samuels, is it Kahlo or Kalo? Kalo, sorry. Um, who wrote sort of a very impassioned sort of look at how computer science is a literacy as opposed to a specific subject or, a, or, or, or you know, applied mathematics. Um, so that's all well and good. But really, the, when it comes down to the, the crux of it, um, we tried to define what is that meaningful unit, that sort of amorphous thing that was defined as the, the, the goal of the cs for all initiative. And again, creative computing is important. Let me zoom in here. Oh, that doesn't work. There it is. So the first one is like, let's find a creative application. Let's not have kids finding prime numbers. Or you know they can find prime numbers, but maybe there's a, a creative application in finding prime numbers. Or, or there's a creative application in finding evens and odds. You can, you can draw a checkerboard on the screen um, or chessboard. Um, we wanted to make sure that teachers were not grading students based on their code and whether it was correct or not. It based on one of them to grade students on their process and how they got there and were, they able, were the students able to articulate how they got there. Um, we wanted them to, and this is where I'm going to start referencing other stuff in the blueprint, it, the, the units captured all three practices and three of the five concepts that we defined. And so concepts and practices are something, they're terminology that's used to sort of create standards in education. The K-12 CS framework did a lot of that, and this by no means tries to replace or redefine any of that, um, except maybe the, the data section. Um, but we basically tried to, to, to simplify and say, okay, here's, here's a simplified set of concepts and practices in CS uh, that you can use to build your meaningful unit. 
we don't expect teachers to stay here. Like we expect teachers to sort of start here, use these definitions, kind of feel like they're confident in computer science, and then move on and, and look at K and look at the the K twelve CS framework, look at the AP CS principles framework, look at the stuff that's being taught in CSA, and, and kind of build on their knowledge. Um, but you can find that under these concepts and practices tabs. Um, one thing that we sort of stole from the Scratch team is this idea of perspectives, and this I think is probably the thing that I want to spend a little bit of time on. Um, that we we really wanted our the, the the idea of grade bands in CS really didn't make sense to us. Like, what is K two CS versus nine twelve CS when none of those kids have had any experience with this? So we came up with these perspectives, which sort of are more of like a where am I at right now? So uh, you know, maybe to start off, I can play with computer science. Um, and then I can move to any one of these. I can move to being a citizen in computer science where I can question how, these compu how computing affects my life. Or maybe I want to move into being a creator. Um, or I want to I be able to sort of affect change in the work that's around me. Um, so I sort of would like really quickly to see if, like, who here sort of sees themselves as a, somebody that just plays with computer science, that really doesn't feel that confident in making and building, but you're, you're enjoying yourself playing. Yeah, nice. That's good. You should admit that. It's a great place to be. There's so much stuff to, to explore. What about creators? Who, who are people that just like want to build stuff? You feel really confident doing that. Nice. Yes. Innovators. You can sort of look at what other people are doing, build on it. You can sort of contribute to a community. Right. We have a lot of different perspectives here. We have somebody that's a creator and an innovator. That's awesome. Uh, and then citizens, people that are questioning how computing affects our world how it changes who we are, how it affects the people around us, yeah. So but ideally, I think we want students leaving K-12 as citizens. Hopefully, they have experiences in, in all these perspectives, but really like, be able to, to go into whatever it is you're doing next and be able to question computing in an intelligent way, not just be like, oh, Facebook is bad because I, when I click on something there, I get an ad on another website. Like that, do we want more system, systematic thinking. So you can use sort of all the resources here on the blueprint. And what we'd like to see is lots and lots of different meaningful units based on the definitions and the concepts and the practices and perspective I shared with you. Right now, we have some examples up. Um, we have like 15 or 16 that are, that are in the queue that my boss will not let me publish until I get them up to snuff. Um, but what, we'd li I, what I really like to see is you know, 50, 60, 100 different units in the queue. Um, and we're going to be having maybe a little shameless plug for the curriculum hack that Meg Ray is putting on on November 4th right here. Um, Everyone should participate in it. Everybody should participate in it, although I think we're pretty close to capacity on it. So sign up fast. <laughs> there you go. We're already opening second rooms. So if you would like to, in the meantime, if, if you can't make the curriculum hack and you would like to submit, you feel like you have something that is a meaningful CS unit um, that can be done by a public school teacher, never, um, then please share it. And all you have to do, and if you don't have it as a Google Doc, it's very easy to upload things into Google Docs. Drop your Google Doc in here, hit fetch, and you can upload your, your unit. So, I don't know if I want to do this right now, live. I don't know if it'll work with Google Slides, but let's see. Boom. <coughs> nope, okay. So it doesn't work with Google Slides. It has to be a Google Doc, but it should be pretty easy for anybody here to contribute any type of unit you have. Please just send it in. I'm going to look at it. I'll contact you. We can start a conversation, and this is how I think we get to the, the, blue, the folks that know about the Blueprint to be the folks that are also contributing to the Blueprint and are part of the, the community. That's what we're here to do. Um, and I would be remiss, I think, if I didn't show some of the resources on the Blueprint. This is the last thing I'll do. I'll leave you with a video. Diane, do you have a, a favorite video that you'd like me to show? Drumming and debugging, maybe? Okay. So what we did, is, and there's a, I think there's a couple of folks that, that were involved in this. We got a group of teachers together, and we asked them, like, what do you like about each other's CS practices? And we, they visited each other's classrooms, and we recorded what happened. Um, so you know what? I'll do drumming and debugging. That's a good one. It's a good one. 
um, we ended up hiring this teacher. It's a shame, um, sort of. The drum that we play is called djembe, which means unity, and it's about community, unity, working together. Computer science is a tool to make your voice heard. It's a tool to change the world. So I want my kids to have options. My name is Nafisa and when I grow up, I want to be a professional programmer. My name is Vesa and I, when I grow up, I want to be a scientist and I'm sure I'm going to need coding for that. One of the things that we think a lot about is how do we meet kids where they are and what they're interested in. We have a drumming program at our school because many of our students come from West Africa and from the Caribbean and this is a part of their histories. We feel like there's resonance there for them. Five, six, ready, ah. Uh. Seku is the drumming teacher and when children would see Seku for drumming, then they'd come downstairs to come and see me for technology and they naturally would be tapping on the desk. I'm too old to hear tapping on the desk. I can't take it. If you're going to tap on the desk, then the tapping on the desk should have something to do with what I'm going to teach you. Drum it out and find the mistake. Open tag A space H-R-E-F. In their own life, they've experienced a lot of success in their performance work around drumming. And so to help them transfer that feeling of success that they've had in the drumming room into their computer science work has been a really effective collaboration. How many people caught that? I have to incorporate student interest. Once you get what they are interested in, then they will get your lesson. We're putting the code into a rhythm, and we're playing the rhythm on the gym bay. Are you ready? Seku will come in, the kids will drum with Seku. I know nothing about coding. It was like a learning experience, so I was learning as I was teaching at the same time. And what code were we working on? Just reading it, this seems like a whole nother world. And if you've ever looked at a URL, it is a tedious line of characters. How does a fourth grader, or even a sixth grader, quickly find that problem. So the first thing we try to get is the actual code in the rhythm form. Before we even drum, we thought of, let's think of a rhythm. Let's think of a song. Open tag, A space, H-R-E-F. And then once we got comfortable saying the rhythm and singing it, then we can apply it to the drum. This drumming started giving us rhythm and it just let us remember. Drumming is really fun for me, so connecting it with coding is really amazing. While that music is fresh in their head, I want to see if they can solve somebody else's problem. My webpage had, uh, had an image and now it's gone. What did I miss? Lines of code had several errors in the HTML and they had to pick out the errors. And I think that's where they can tap it out step by step. I could just tap myself here and I could just do it. I could just remember like open tag A space H R E F. Open tag I space. So I could just use tapping and I can remember the mistake. When I just like tried to scan through the code with my eyes, I really didn't notice anything much. So when I started drumming it out, it like I was like, oh wait, there it is. Coding with music doesn't have to be drumming. We've done HTML with funk, with rap, with hip hop. I could do HTML with Tchaikovsky. I could do HTML with ACDC. You can just do it, whatever your child's particular interest is. Try it again while I watch. Speed round, I'm gonna give you two minutes. Go to Mozilla Thimble and just add a link and add an image very quickly. Let's see how you do that. I want my kids to know code and then they get to create things and then they get to take part in all these things that are going on in the world. My children know how to code and then they're powerful people.
Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot more videos on here. You should check them out. Uh, thank you, Diane. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Gordon. Um, and I guess questions or other things? No? no? Okay, we'll cool. Okay. Hi, my name is Amy Rosado, and I'm from Teals. And that's a pretty tough video to follow. I, um, at Teals, we're really excited about the new CSTA chapter in New York City. So at Teals, we help high schools build and grow sustainable computer science programs. So we work with people who are completely new to computer science. We also work with experienced computer science teachers. And what we do is we partner teachers with industry volunteers who, are, who want to give back. And um, we started in 2009 with one school and 12 students. And now we're in about 350 schools across the country. We're a Microsoft Philanthropies program. So we were started by a Microsoft employee. Um, and you can kind of see this is where we are spread out. 350 schools, multiple classes in some schools. So we're actually in a lot of different classrooms. Um, we have about 1,100 um, 1 volunteers, volunteer teachers. In this area, we're in about 33 schools supporting 40 classes, and our teachers run the gamut from people who are completely new to computer science who are basically experts in computer science. So we work with all types of teachers. And we have some schools in Jersey as well. Um, so depending on your experience level with computer science, we have different levels of support. So if you're a teacher that needs a lot of support, we have the co-teach model where you would get a bigger team of volunteers to come into the classroom and help you out. But if you're more experienced and say you just want a TA in your class to help with, um, like, help with student projects, lab support, um, we have the lab support model. And then say if you're completely independent teaching computer science, you're an expert, you've been doing this for many years, but you really want that industry perspective from a, a mentor, like a guest speaker, or just somebody who can talk to your kids about what they do on the job, we can also set you up with that as well. We also provide different curricula depending on what schools need. So we have an introduction to computer science class in SNAP and or Python. We also support computer science A, the Java class. And then for computer science principals, um, we can provide lab support for different um, curriculum providers, such as code.org and BJC. In New York, there are a lot of schools that are kind of hard to reach for volunteers, or just hard to reach in general. So we also have remote teaching support. So if you're, if you're at a school, um, this was taken at a school in Cypress Hills, Brooklyn, and um, we have volunteers that actually teleconference in and help a teacher teach computer science. So if you're interested, I'll be here kind of mingling with people. Um, we'd love to, I'd love to talk with you about what, how we can work together. Um, we're really excited for the CSTA chapter to support all types of computer science teachers, beginners to experts. And I'll pass it back to Diane. That was great. And I actually did not know about all that support that Teals provides until we talked. So I'm really grateful that you came and made that clear to people, because some of you are experienced CSA teachers. and um, just having somebody from the industry come in and talk to your kids about what they can do is really magical. So, ah, okay, well now I'm calm because there was like enough food and there were enough chairs and we're all here, so, and it didn't rain and, um, and the AV worked and we got the blinds up, so I'm pretty happy. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what we do uh, in K-12 here at Cornell Tech and why we do it. Um, just because you're in my house and you're gonna to get to know us, I think, this year. We are the academic partner for the CSTA chapter. Um, so first I wanna ask, how many people here either went to Cornell, have a parent that went to Cornell, or a kid who's going to Cornell? Yeah, there you go. So uh, this is, you know, um, I grew up in New York and I went to Barnard and then I moved to uh, Los Angeles for 20 years. And in the time that I grew up here, I really didn't know a lot of Cornelians. But when Cornell brought me back, I'm literally never in a room that does not have at least five or six people 
who have a Cornell connection. And it's super cool for me. It makes me feel very tied into the city of New York. So you probably know that we won a competition uh, from the Bloomberg administration uh, six, almost seven years ago now. Um, everybody thought Stanford was going to win, including Cornell. And, uh, and we won instead, yay. <laughs> and that is why I have a job. So, um, and, uh, and from the beginning, even in the original proposal, there is a, a commitment to K-12 that is core to the mission of this campus. Um, I think partly because my dean really saw this as um, a way to do business with the city, honestly, in the business of educating children, 1.1 million children, uh, 1.1 million reasons to teach computer science. Uh, partly because uh, of a pipeline, not so much a pipeline to Cornell, but a pipeline to the New York City tech ecosystem that we are charged with building out. But mostly uh, because he considered this a social justice issue. That um, what is clearly going to be um, an important form of citizenship uh, Regardless of what you do for a living, uh, regardless of where you live or where you were born, uh, everybody is going to need to understand computing in a deep way. Um, the, uh, what I often say to people is that when I was in middle school, I played the viola very badly. Um, but uh, nobody took the viola away from me because I wasn't going to Juilliard. They said, uh, you're going to live in a, in a world full of music, and making music changes how you experience music for the rest of your life. And I, I think of that a lot when we think about why we are here and doing what we do. Um, so uh, this campus put a lot of resources behind this. They brought me here from California, and I am not as young as I look. So, uh, uh, and, um, and they have given us, put me on a very long leash. Don't say anything, Anke, that's not nice. Uh, and let me do what I need to do. And this is one of the most important things I wanted to do, was to start to bring everyone together, um, teachers and, and nonprofits, and teachers who already teach CS, and teachers who are learning to teach CS, and people who have been teaching CS in informal environments all together as a sort of a new CSTA chapter and a model for the rest of the country. So I hope you're excited to join me in that mission. Um, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Meg Ray, who is um, uh, sort of owning the innovation that we're testing right now. Uh, Meg Ray is our teacher in residence. She is a content coach in uh, classrooms where teachers are t learning to teach CS. So she's, well, I'll, I'm going to let her describe what she does. OK, so um, Diane had a wonderful idea uh, for something called the Teacher in Residence Program and brought me on to build that out. Um, teacher in Residence means that we have a coach, which right now is me, in residence at a school one day a week. And we're really focused on a computational agency. Um, and by that, we mean we want students not just to be able to um, follow a tutorial or take a test. We want them to build something digital that has meaning for them. And we also want teachers to have agency with CS. We want them to learn all the different curricula, all the different tools, and then teach CS like they would any other subject by picking and choosing what's right for their students. And we build that agency in the schools, and we build a sustainable program um, that won't go away with one teacher or one staff member. Um, we work with administration to make it part of the school culture. And we train the administration on all of the standards that are coming out, the blueprint, the CSTA standards, those types of things. Um, and right now, we're just innovating and finding out what works and what doesn't work when it comes to training teachers. And we're also examining what works and doesn't work when it comes to giving students with disabilities access to the curriculum. Thank you, Meg. 
Thank you. So thank you, Meg. We were really lucky that Meg was willing to come here and be brave enough to try this for the first time. We've taken this idea of content coaching, which is used in many other subjects, and uh, brought it into the uh, K-8 classrooms. I'm really proud that the K-8 here on Roosevelt Island now teaches computer science. Pre-K-8. Sorry. Pre-K-8 <laughs> teaches computer science in every classroom every week. Uh, throughout the school year with Meg's support. And they were a SEP junior school. Thank you, Ankit. Uh, so uh, thank you, Lionel, uh, from and Alana. Oh, OK. Um, uh, with, uh, through the support of DOE and Meg, um, they have made that commitment. And, uh, and it is live and in color. So yay. OK, so we have a reason now uh, for you all to be here. It's your turn to talk. Uh, which is, um, I have a challenge, really, for the group, which is how might we create an organization that you really want to spend time with, right? So it's not just like, what do you need? Although it's partly, what do you need? Um, it's not just, what do you want, either to eat, drink, or talk about? It's like, what? What should bring us together? Because um, CSTA would like us to meet pretty regularly. Um, and, and we would like to be together and learn from each other. Um, so I'm going to open this up and ask you to tell me what you want us to be and do uh, going forward. Uh, and hold on, Gordy, you're taking notes. Yes. Thank you. Go. So. Um... You know, in my uh, high school that I used to teach at, we, what we did was we would do something after school like a club uh, where we would think of what new projects can we do with the regular class. And then we would like try a robotics project, we would try like an Arduino project, and what works, then we would use in the class, you know, either next term or next year. So if we can do something like that where, you know, you guys have funds to get the chips, Instead of us having, you know, like the, our the school budgets are not, you know, that great, and we can come here, and we could try. Let's say, okay, there's this, you know, like some. You guys can agree on one project, you know. Uh, let's say we're gonna do monitoring plants or whatever. Everybody wanted to do that, but it's like, you know, oh, you know, instead of me sitting there figuring it out and taking that time ordering whatever, you guys probably can, you know, with the. So we have some electrical engineers. We have a lot more people that are more knowledgeable than me, and we'll make less mistakes than me sitting there having to figure it out with the kids, you know. And we'll do, you know, if we see that's something, okay, this works really well for like at the high school level. Well, maybe it's not going to work so much for my new job at the middle school level, <laughs> or you know, like we'll we'll be able to decide what works at what level and how can you make it work for different levels, what chips and things like that's an idea that I thought could be useful and would bring us together and we would work and produce nice things and learn from them. And it would be fun. It would be fun, yes. <laughs> Which I'm, I'm, I believe in rigor and joy. Who, is, uh, who else would like to speak? I did have an organizational question. I mean, CSTA, so this is now, now we have a New York City chapter. We do. Okay, now many of us are CS, I don't know, maybe that's not true. Some of us are CSTA members and have been for quite a while. So what's the relationship coordination between our new New York chapter and the national organization? I'm the one who licked the stamp that said maybe we should do something. Um, the, Diane and I went down to the Baltimore conference. Um, the prior weekend there was a, a leadership group. I think maybe some of you were in, in on that. So run by uh, Mark Nelson. Mark was the president of um, CSTL together, like national body up in Albany. And I think since then he's um, either taken a leave or is, has moved on. And so our relationship as a body is they sort of, uh, on that Saturday we met with their leadership of CSTA and some of the other folks and said, this is what sort of the other chapters do. This is what you need to sort of get going. Um, but we're all finding our way a little bit too. Um, and so we're trying to build relationships with the other CSTA uh, organizations, um, specifically Oregon. They seem to have a really good thing going there, like in, in a, for the entire state in Chicago, I think. 
um, to see how they're running their chapters to be informed by their failures and successes and to help along this particular one. Now, for those of you who are in CST chapter in New York City prior to that, I don't know when it started and I don't know when it stopped, but I know that it was, it was defunct. And so for those of you who are members of that, I hope you'll reach out to me and say, this is the things that worked and things that didn't, or maybe sort of explain the history of the prior chapter, because um, I haven't met anyone there yet. Yes, well, so in New York State, there's a number of chapters itself, like uh, Albany has a chapter, and I think there's a chapter in, in Staten Island, Staten Island and um, one in the, uh, 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 what town is that? Uh, it's up on the river, I forget. Uh, there's another chapter up there. Um, you know, you yeah. can have a CSTA chapter as long as you have eight members. That's actually the minimum. Um, and our thinking was, Certainly, we'll be pushing out to you information that we get from the national chapter, but you're going to get that already. So the benefit of the local chapter is really what you see here. It's getting together. It's knowing each other. It's leveraging each other for ideas. And the, everything that happens with the national chapter will continue to happen. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. I think the next year's national meeting is in Sacramento. That's a heads up if you wanted to work on it. Omaha. Omaha, sorry, sorry. I think that was, I think that was a 60 maybe. Um, if you wanted to attend that to see how things are organized at a national level. I think both speaking for Diane, I think I can once in a while do that. Um, uh, I think it was really beneficial to see and meet the other chapter members, specifically at the leadership level, to say, all right, we're, we're noobs. We need to get this going. Tell us what to do. And one thing we learned is that everybody does it really differently. And we've decided that because New York City K-12 computer science is such a rich and diverse group of people, we're just going to kind of do it our way. Yeah, Lionel. Uh, so this is just a question. Because New York City is so big and so spread out that having one local chapter might be difficult. So what should we recommend to like teachers, you know, if they're like in the North Bronx and like, yeah, you know what, getting to Roosevelt Island just isn't something we want, we can do, but we want to, we have eight of us in the North Bronx and we want to start a chapter. Like, are you looking to do that too? Because I think that would be helpful. Yeah. Or if not, sorry, if not start a chapter, start a committee. Whatever. Right? Yeah. Or, and also move this meeting around. I mean, we do not have to be on Roosevelt Island every month. That is, I mean, I love it here, but I'm here all the time. So I'm happy to go uh, to you. Yeah. Oh, no, I was just going to um, add on to Lionel of can these things be streamed so people that aren't near Roosevelt Island, because I don't know how many people actually are near Roosevelt Island. 13,000 people live on <laughs> Roosevelt Island. <laughs> but how many here in the room live in Roosevelt Island? Um, but also, one of the things that I would like to see is, um, especially in thinking about um, CSTA in terms of the K-8 group. Right. And the doing things involving, like, continuing with, like, what we've been doing with Scratch Ed meetups and things like that. And also, um, thinking about how to leverage parent meetups as well to get more parents on board with computer science in their schools as well. So um, I want to respond by saying uh, we have thought all along that maybe a committee structure would really serve us this way, that we might get together as a big group, uh, you know, periodically, five or six times a year, but that we might also create a K-8 group, uh, a Brooklyn, a Bronx, a Western Queens, Eastern Queens group. Uh, you know, Gordy is waving at me, so I'm walking over there. But, um, but also, I want to say that um, we had, you know, in order to get the charter, we had to sort of make some commitments to the national organization. And we did have a couple of ideas, not that we have to, I don't think they're going to like send the CSTA police to us. But uh, we had a couple of ideas for the next few months just to sort of get us rolling. And um, can I do this before you talk? Um, and one of them was that on November, uh, four, five, six, seven, no, six, eight, sorry, got it. <laughs> the Wednesday, which I think is November 8th, um, we would like uh, to have our next meetup, and we are bringing a, um, a CS educator in to the country from England. 
where they're a little bit ahead of us in terms of having a national curriculum rolled out. Um, he's going to keynote a conference that we hold here uh, called To Code and Beyond on November 3rd, which you're all welcome to attend, although it is during the school day. So we thought we'd bring him to a meetup on that Wednesday night, the 8th, to, uh, and he'll be at the curriculum hackathon, too, uh, that Meg has tweeted out to everyone using the hashtag CTSTANYC. Um, so uh, we thought, and that it may be um, a, a K-8 meetup, uh, just in the sense that he is, I think, primarily a K-8 educator, but uh, yeah, okay, I'm turning it over to you. Um, no, I'm just one quick thing I wanted to remind everybody about was from my uh, brief speaking moment there a little while ago. Um, maybe something to consider is the survey that we plan on sending out to look at structure, uh, like committees and such, or borough reps, or that sort of thing, or borough meetings, or um, birds of a feather groups. Um, your suggestions then or now, it might be something compelling so we could send out to the survey to say, would this be compelling to you? So um, think about that now, and if you have something to say, please, 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 and if not, maybe um, when we send around other notes box, so you can put something in there and say, there should be a blank for this. Um, I think that'd be super helpful. Like we were saying, like I was saying initially before, we're in a startup situation here, and so we're trying to get a lot of thought, uh, a lot of group thinking. Did, did everybody give us our, your information on the Google Sheet? Because um, that's we'll, we'll push stuff out that way. OK. Other ideas for what we could be doing? Thank you. Um, mine's less of an idea, but more of a value. My name is Brian Fountain. Uh, I'm the former chief creative officer of a coding boot camp here called New York Code and Design Academy. Uh, I actually recently left there to start a software organization that's in um, ed tech. And um, I'm kind of curious to see, uh, so I spent the last four years teaching adult learners. I'm kind of curious if like those skill sets, obviously I think the preponderance of the room is, is in K through 12. So uh, if, if things that I've learned in that space are useful and valuable in any way, and if so, I'm very happy to share that type of knowledge that I've gained. Uh, and then uh, very curious, honestly to learn more about the problems of K through 12 as well too, just to find out like where the thing that I get the most upset about as a programmer is like re work done again and over and over again. So the idea of shared resources and pooling that type of, you know, collaborative editing efforts and that sort of thing is, is, you know, very important to me too. I just, the idea that more than like five people in this room would be at home late at night working on the exact same thing that <laughs> that other people are like working on like makes me a little angry uh so like uh so yeah i'm kind of interested in helping efforts in that way too about just sharing resources um as well thanks thank you thank you hi i'm oiling sin and i teach um high school math at a 6 through 12 school in the bronx and I'm interested or curious to know, is it possible without starting a computer science class, how can I integrate computer science into school initiatives? Uh, my school, um, through my principal's hard work, he was able to get a grant for $2 million to build a rooftop garden so that my uh, art school can have live performances on the rooftop. And it would be great for my math students to somehow in integrate computer science connected to the rooftop garden. So I'm curious in doing that. There are people in this room who can help you with that. <laughs> so uh, all of you who are thinking about sensors and gardens, yes. How many of people here from NICEST, raise your hand high. Okay, so NICEST is an organization that we can m mimic or steal from. Uh, we started in 1992, New York City Independent School Technologists. <clears throat> we meet once a month at a different place, usually a school, but not always a school. Sometimes we meet at Google, sometimes we meet at Tumblr, sometimes we meet um, at the World Science Fair or Wherever, thank you, Karen. Um, Karen's former president. We have a listserv. 
which, uh, which is like the best thing ever. You post a question and five people answer by the end of the day, any question. And it's also a job board. Um, three of the last four jobs I've had, I got from this listserv. Uh, no kidding. Anyway, it's a great model. And another model for CSTA is CSNY. Because as a member, I've enjoyed it tremendously. And it's an open, open sort of play space where, some, where people can share ideas and members can present. And uh, that's all. Yeah. Just to piggyback on that, uh, a subset of NICEST is NICEST K6, and that's a group of really K through 8 um, technology educators at independent schools who meet four times a year, and I work with that group. Public school teachers have come to our meetings, and as some of us get older and have been in this field for a long time, we want to share what we've developed in the private school sector with the public schools. At least I know that's one of my goals. So, um, and we try to make the meetings so they don't fall during public school vacations. If you're interested in that group, uh, I'm on the list that's um, accumulating. Karen's involved with NICES K6 too, so you can contact us and, and join our listserv, which is a subset of, of NICES. They're both been organizations that those of us who have been teaching in private school have relied on for a tremendous amount of support, and we hope that we can bring some of what we've learned through those organizations to this group. That's amazing. Thank you. And you're, you're comfortable with public school teachers joining that list? Yes. Amazing. Well, I, I think that the, the, the people... I can't speak, cannot speak for the membership of the larger NICEST. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that you would email if you want to join the NICEST K6 list. And I usually ask, with what organization are you affiliated? And if somebody were to write to me and said, I'm trying to teach computer science in a public school in the Bronx, I'd say, join. But I, as I said, I can't speak for whoever is deciding on membership for the larger NICES group. Great. Thank you. And uh, maybe what we'll do is leverage uh, that contribution on a CSTA uh, e-list as well. Other comments or ideas or questions? Here I come, Stephen. Sure. Hi, Stephen Lewis. I uh, teach computer science at the high school level, but I also develop um, hardware and software for STEM. I want to pick up a little bit on what you had suggested, and in the software area, it's rather a particular aspect that I'm interested in, but I teach exclusively in P5JS. I find it's a very, very versatile um, platform for teaching. It has terrible support. It has no K-12 resources whatsoever, but I could, I'm trying to build them myself, but I would love to see one of the possible things that comes out of a group like this to be a subcommittee, which we, short, we share some particular aspect of teaching um, with a particular language um, as, a, as opposed to making it too generic, but, and we develop a curriculum ourselves, piece by piece. Um, even if it's a small sort of goal, like the first 10 lessons of an introductory 10th grade, 9th grade, 8th grade computer science using this particular language and, and the resources that we would build ourselves. So I think we have a robust, fairly reliable platform that's unfortunately sort of being abandoned a little bit by the original group that developed it. They all have jobs and they're, you know, they're, but I think it, it's pretty robust and I, I would love to see something like that come to coalesce where maybe five, six, seven of us could build a, the beginnings of a curriculum around that. And Saber Khan, who's not here uh, tonight because I think he's running a ethical CS Twitter uh, chat right now, has, is really, huh? Yeah, it's at 8 p.m., so you could actually join the Twitter chat at 8. Um, has a, has a, a P5 community that he's building. So, um, uh, and that's a really interesting piece. I'm coming, Ben. This isn't the most time efficient strategy. Don't yell. Okay. Hi. I was going to respond to two things. One, there is a, oh, I'm Ben. Thank you. And I am now going to keep. Trying to remember what I was saying before. Um, there is a CS teacher Slack channel that grew out of the blueprint work that you saw up there. If you don't know what Slack is, 
it's like email, but nicer for responding to people. It's a communications platform that we've been using to do that work, but also just troubleshoot and share things into your point about P5. Um, CSNYC was actually kind enough or foolish enough to allow me to do a PD on P5. I learned things from Sabra. There are people in schools all over the city building curriculum. We just don't know where each other are because we're overly siloed. And so I think Slack has been a great place where we post a question. I don't know Python. I ask Tim a question. Tim helps me. I go teach. Um, that's a very nice, quick turnaround, and it makes it possible for people to share resources across schools without worrying about whether public, private, whatever. The second point that I wanted to suggest is we are all probably, this is something Sean and I were just talking about, we're all probably really good at thinking of the things we do well and sharing them. So I got to talk about P5 or whatever. Um, the most important thing for our kids are the things we don't know how to do and aren't good at yet. And I think being able to share, do lesson study, here's a video of a lesson that I taught, what weaknesses do you see, what goes better in your classroom, what are you better at, how are your assessments tighter than mine, here's a worksheet that I wrote, what's wrong with it, why is it not accessible to L's, um, those kinds of things, bring it to this group of people and then bring in people who have expertise we don't have. So if you're coming to one of these, bring a friend who's a great ELA teacher who would probably look at our language and be like, Ugh. or a great math teacher who's going to help you tighten your vocabulary because there's no reason to use seven words for something they have one word for and the kids need to know it for their class. Things like that where we, we have opportunities to learn from people in this room and not just share but also get feedback and make our work tighter. That idea. Ankit, did you want to say something? Yeah. Can you say what that slack was? Ankit got it. What's the slack? He's got it. Okay, he's going to tell you now. Yeah. I might have texted Ben to tell everybody about that. Uh, CS for all, number for all uh, teachers, all one word, dot slack dot com. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say about P5, we have, we worked with the Processing Foundation to make a one a full year P5 curriculum, which I can share the link with everybody if there's some way for us to all communicate. So Slack or Lister or something, we should have something. Great, thank you. That's exciting, I would like to see that also. Here I come. Hi, I'm Tom Lynch, I'm an ed tech professor at Pace University. Um, I was gonna say here in Manhattan, I'm in Manhattan, all right? Okay, good, great. The Roosevelt Island thing uh, throws me off a little bit. Okay, I bet. Um, I just wanted to say that I think you, the two things that I keep thinking a lot about are um, what, what it means for our city schools to have computer science integrated into multiple content areas, to especially core content areas. Because I think that at a minimum, it's at least kind of a two front approach where having um, having separate kind of computer science classes is important and opportunities to learn is important, but it's also really important if it's as meaningful and as important as literacy, as I've heard people say, then it also needs to be embedded into other, as many content areas as possible. So the work that I do as an ed tech professor has been focused on recently on trying to integrate it into English classes, the ELA, mostly secondary. Um, and so, and I did um, soft launch a website called cs4ela.org um, and I'm convening Yep, the four. Yeah, totally. I just, -O yeah, F-O-R, thank you. I bit the whole CS for all. Um, and I'm convening English education professors around the country who are the ones who would teach the future English teachers to like, to weigh in on this with their expertise in like teaching English. It also raises, I think, a, a, another question, which might be like, what's the role of universities and teacher preparation programs um, in the work that you're doing in this room as well? And there is some work I know happening at Hunter already, I believe. There's work happening here as well, right? Um, but their teacher preparation is a, is a huge part of the work that happens in schools. And increasingly, those teacher preparation programs are trying to provide ongoing support to their graduates as well, because they're, they're kind of being externally assessed to do so. <laughs> so thinking of ways, too, that we might be able to engage the higher educational institutions involved could also be another sort of track or stream to consider it's a very, very exciting moment you're in as an organization right now, and I hope you feel that sense of opportunity and excitement in the room. I certainly do. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jerry Pippinella. I teach uh, high school at Hillcrest High School. I've been teaching for about 13 years. Believe it or not, I'm not 35 years old. Uh, I spent about 25 years in industry, and what industry values is problem solvers. And I don't know about the educators in the classroom, but it's a zone high school, Jamaica, Queens. 
what I generally find when we get ninth or 10th graders in is many of them have found a way to sit in a classroom and they've learned very well that if they sit quietly, they'll be able to be told the answer. And they don't solve problems. They don't understand what a problem is. They don't know how to read it, interpret it, process it, and come up with a solution for it. What I would like CSTA to do is really concentrate on a curriculum that requires students to read, to interpret, to process, to be able to explain the question, the problem, and then be able to put together the pieces to solve it. Because I spend a lot of time what I feel like, and, and there's no disrespect here to any of the teachers involved in this, because I'm sure you feel my frustration, to having to unlearn that habit. And that's what I would like a curriculum to become. And, and CS is a method because it's so regimented. It has to be one step after the other after the other to make it work. A computer will only do exactly what you tell it to do and doesn't understand what you want it to do. Uh, and that's what I spend most of my time doing. So that's what I would like CSTA to do. Okay. That's a tall order. Um, so this is a little bit of a, I'm Sean Stern. I work at the Academy for Software Engineering. Um, I've been there for five years, used to be a software engineer. Um, a little bit in New York, not technically, okay. second year. Um, so I think one of the important things, our school, the Academy for Software Engineering, was it's a public school. It was started as a partnership uh, between the city and Fred Wilson, um, who's at uh, Union Square Ventures. And the idea was to create schools where kids could get CS, and that would be a focus, but it's unscreened, right? So every kid has access. Um, and I used to work in industry, so when I went into teaching, I had these very lofty ideas of sort of what sort of CS my kids would do. My background in CS education was only in college, right? So I went in, I don't want to say unprepared, but maybe with a little bit of an unrealistic expectation. Um, and I think one of the things that keeps me passionate about CS education, and this is a little bit of a response is, occasionally I get people who come into our building, the name of the school is the Academy for Software Engineering. There are even people on our board who say things like, and this is not what the gentleman was saying, but industry as a whole needs to see the reality of what public schools in New York look like, right, across the broad spectrum of our kids. That's not to say that, like, we're doing a great job and we couldn't do better, right? I'm, I'm, I agree with a lot of what Ben said, that we need to be more critical as a community. But I think sometimes people reflect on their own educational experience in industry and they assume that that's what our high schools look like. Like I grew up in the suburbs, went to a really nice public school, right? That was very well off. I went to college, that was CS. And I think sometimes there's a big disconnect in terms of what the school system actually looks like versus what people sort of want our kids to come out prepared to be able to do. Um, and the more that both sides can understand that, the better feedback we'll get as teachers to say like, hey, this is something you could address that you're doing badly, but also, you know, if my room is not filled with self-taught autodidacts of CS, that, that is a little bit me because I made it in college and that's not most kids. So coming together and really understanding and interacting and inviting those people into the space, I think could be really valuable. Um, that was a long-winded one, but thanks for, thanks for the microphone. I appreciate it. You always add a lot of value. Okay. Um, so hi, I'm Mike Zemanski and um, I just want to kind of go a little further on what Sean just said, which was a great point. Um, but it's also beyond that, um, and I'd like to see the chapter here look at um, the reality of best practices. And what I mean by that, not only industry comes in and says you should do A, B, and C, and this is what education could look like, because, damn it, I went to school, so clearly I know how it's done. Um, but you also hear from the education researchers, you know, and not so much necessarily CS education researchers, because there are so few of them, but education researchers who will come down with the latest, you know, for when I was um, studying teaching uh, 
uh, cooperative learning was the cure for cancer back then. And since then, we've had three or four cures for cancer and everything else, and we're still back where we started from. Um, but I had a wonderful conversation with Elizabeth Moge, the dean of um, University of Michigan's Ed School, and she was a breath of fresh air because she's a researcher. And, um, and she's like, yeah, and the stuff we're doing is just can't be done in a public school classroom with 34 kids and 40 minute period um, and talk about that reality. Um, and I'd love to see a real discussion, not about what the ivory tower people, and I'm an ivory tower person now, I'm at Hunter College now, um, but what teachers know have to be done and can be done under practical circumstances under the school, in the schools that we're teaching in. Um, and I'd also love to see a conversation CS education is, we're now the hot field. You know, we have the air, air now of multiple administrations, federal level, state level, and local level. Um, but things we do have effects on the education profession as a whole, and a lot of things we do have unintended consequences. Uh, so going back to Michigan, uh, back when I was talking with Elizabeth a few weeks ago, we were lamenting over the fact that Michigan, um, they just got rid of all of their standards for technical teachers. And you may have read about that in the, in the news a couple of months ago. And it's like, oh, it's too hard to find qualified tech teachers, so let's get rid of all credentials, because then we can hire people, because. It's the credentials that are stopping us, not the pay, not the conditions. Um, and I had a conversation with, um, with some CS advocates in the Michigan area, and it was clear to me that this was an unintended consequence of a quick rollout of, no, no, you don't need the CS teacher. They can just do this training. They can teach CS principals. Look at the success we had here with, with just summer training. And these are unintended consequences of us being so anxious to get the win and to scale. And what's happening is we're devaluing public education as a whole, and that's 90% of the students in this country are public school students. And I'd love to see us as a, as a collective entity talk about that and talk about are we actually in such a rush to get a seat at the table that we're basically undercutting the profession, and by the time we get to that table, there'll be nothing left. Um, and I think that's a very important point. But anyway, so, so this is the, the mistake that Diane made because she gave me the microphone and then walked away, so. <laughs> so um, all right, so, but, um, but I also just did want to briefly mention, um, so I spent my career at Stuyvesant High School developing the program there, a lot of that with my partner in crime, John Alf over here, um, who, who is tremendous and I owe a lot to. Um, but, um, but I'm now at Hunter College and we are one of the institutions developing uh, teacher training programs. Right now we've got um, programs that are, are kind of sitting up in Albany waiting for approval. Um, so we're right on the cusp. Um, we recently just, you know, we, we um, were also an approved I don't know what they're called now, but the professional development provider. And so we're hoping to offer some of that to the community. Um, so, so even though we're just right on the cusp at Hunter because we've got to get that state approval, um, we're very close to offer um, a number of things in terms of professional development, in terms of, of, uh, of courses, in-service, pre-service, et cetera. Um, I obviously have to check with the powers that be, but I'd love to, to see if, if we at Hunter could host one, because you know, it'll be so much more convenient to be four blocks that way than here, you know, so. <laughs> I'll just get the canoe. <laughs> awesome, so. Okay. I'll take it. Hi, um, my name's Jolly McPhee. Apart from being your videographer, um, I, uh, I also ha have another hat, which is I'm the president of the Internet Society New York chapter. The Internet Society is a global organization. Um, we do technical stuff. We do all kinds of stuff. Uh, so we, and we get involved with other people's projects, and we give grants to those projects. And if you join, you can apply for grants. One people that we're put, a group that we're just working with now is uh, Lee McKnight, who's at Syracuse University, who's doing something c called Internet in a Backpack. And it's a satellite uplink and a small cell. And so he has projects working with New York schools. The one that he told me about was uh, they've got this thing sat on a volcano in the Congo with sensors around. And there's a bunch of school kids somewhere, I think, in the Bronx who monitor it. And they tell, they're going to tell the people in the village in the Congo if this thing's going to blow and it's going to land on them. He's interested in getting more, more stuff. I've arranged for him to do a workshop at the Radical Networks Conference in the middle of November somewhere in New York. You can radicalnetworks.org. Um, 
Another thing is that uh, we also do something called the Internet Hall of Fame, where we, we honor the people who invented the Internet and pioneers. And, uh, and so I'm sort of interested, you know, for you guys who are computer science teachers, I took computer science A-level in England in 1969, and, uh, you know, Algol. And, uh, but uh, we did a lot of history. I mean, I had to learn about Babbage and Hollerith and all this stuff. Uh, do you guys teach history? Yeah. yeah. So one of our members who might be here tonight as, uh, is, is developing a curriculum on internet history. And so we've just applied for funding for him to run a workshop in conjunction with CSMYC and CSTA, and we're yet to tell them properly about it, but uh, which will be in about November or sometime. So that's something that you can look for coming up, which will be, you know, not just to like lay out some kind of basic curriculum, but, but also for you to feedback on how best to present it. Thank you for recording this. Uh, yeah, here I come, Brian. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Miller. I am actually uh, an intruder. I am from Florida. Um, but I am the director of strategic outreach for Wonder Workshop creators of Dash and Dot Robots. But, um, and if you have questions about that, feel free to ask. But uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to stand up and talk a little bit real quick about things that would be great to see from this chapter, and not just this chapter, but from other chapters. Um, I've been an educator for 15 years. I was a kindergarten teacher, K through five computer teacher, and then director of ed tech at the second largest private independent school in the US in Florida. Um, and I had worked very closely with CSTA, worked very closely with CS for All, um, have known Mark Nelson for quite some time. And how many of you were at the CSTA conference in Baltimore this past year? Yeah, so one of the conversations that I had with Mark afterwards was a congratulatory conversation because attending the conference in San Diego the year before, I noticed that there was a disconnect between CS teachers and everyday curriculum teachers. And this for me at the conference was the first year that I felt like it was an inclusive conference where everyone was welcome. And I don't know if others felt the same way, but I really felt that it was um, something that we need to see a lot more of. So one of the things that I would love to see from this chapter, but also see from other chapters throughout the US, is to be inclusive of every teacher, to be challenged to go out and invite ev other everyday teachers out to join us in these movements, invite them to meetings, invite them to events, because sometimes they just need to have that aha moment where they're sitting in a room with other passionate educators uh, to see that there is a connection with what they're doing and what, what we're doing, uh, just to push them over the edge to feel comfortable teaching this every day. So I would love to see that from this organization and from others, um, so thank you. Uh, that we be a, a model in that way of being really inclusive. So um, I think we have time for one more question. My goal was to end at eight, and it's just uh, a minute after. Do your last question, and then I'll do my next thing. Thank you. It's, Thank it's you. less of a question, more of an introduction, since Jolie McPhee from the Internet Society kindly mentioned that. Um, my name is Ruben. Um, I'm head of an organization, a nonprofit called Living Online Lab, and we have developed a curriculum for sixth grade through 12 primarily on internet studies, which I teach at an independent school in Princeton. And um, it covers everything from history of the internet, how the internet works, internet and society, right through cyber psychology, remix, um, a whole host of things, over 30 lesson plans we have at the moment. Uh, they're being taught in Canada, in South Carolina, uh, in England, the Middle East, Africa, uh, and more and more schools. So if anyone is interested, I'm very happy to share more information about this curriculum. Thank you. Um, I'm so uh, grateful to all of you for coming and for joining us on this new adventure. And I hope I see you all again soon. Please be in touch with us. I'm uh, diane.levitt at cornell.edu. Many of you have gotten an email from me. All of you will get an email from me tomorrow. So uh, your ideas, your comments, your criticism, your dreams, your hopes, uh, you know, your vision, all welcome. Uh, put that screen back up because I, need to I am going to put the screen back up. Yes. Look, here I go.
you want to say goodnight, Gordy? Yes, goodnight, Gordy. Goodnight, Chet. Um, I'm just add sort of one thing is uh, I get a deeper appreciation for everything that Michael and his team have done over there and running an event like this and building up sort of community inside of the city. So props to him for getting us all together and getting going here. Um, last thing I would say is I think this chapter will be as good as the community involvement in it. I think, uh, you know, speaking for myself and Diane and Michael, you know, having uh, full-time work and not CSTA is not the only thing game in town. I think uh, it will be as good as everyone's involvement in it. So if you're waiting to say, well, what are they up to? What's the show? Should I go to that tonight? Well, I think you should go to it whenever you can go to it and then bring you, you bring everything you can to the to the community that's what i'm that was all about i had one goal tonight was like build the community so i'm hoping we're, this is the beginning of something that goes on and on and on and on that's it thanks thanks gordy thanks everyone